Hi, welcome to um, Frontier Nursing University's evening tonight talking about entrepreneurship and owning your own business and finding ways to make yourself self-successful in the business of um, looking after families. And so I'm Tanya Nicholson. I'm the Associate Dean of Midwifery and Women's Health at Frontier Nursing University. And I'm pleased to have my friend and mentor and colleague, Dr. Kitty Ernst, with us. She is going to talk with us about something that she is very passionate about. She is the Mary Breckenridge Chair at Frontier Nursing University, among multiple other things I could tell you about her, but instead, I'm going to let her use this time. So, Kitty, I'm going to start with a question of why would a nurse practitioner or a nurse midwife decide to own their own business instead of just being employed by somebody else? Well, two things. First of all, I have to correct you. I am not Dr. Ernst. You do not use the title of doctor unless you earned it. And I have an honorary degree, not an earned degree. Okay. Okay, honorary doctor. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> You're assuming that you have to own your own business to be an entrepreneur. So I'd like to start by clarifying for everybody that may be listening that what is, what is an entrepreneur? An entrepreneur is merely a risk taker. So you don't have to start your own business. I think of just going into midwifery makes you an entrepreneur because that's a high risk profession. You know, it's not well accepted in this country. There are lots of problems getting employment, getting paid for your services, all, all kinds of things that you're going to encounter. So that it's, it, you know, it's not like, not a guaranteed type of thing, uh, but it's getting a lot better, thank goodness. So I see people as, uh, you know, the home birth people are certainly entrepreneurs and uh, certainly those that have private practice. The birth centers have been a very organized entrepreneurial group that wants to put midwifery on Main Street. That's their main mission where women can find the midwifery services that they're currently looking for. I, I think distance education took a high level of entrepreneurship in which everybody was involved. It was a high risk. We didn't know whether it was going to work, but we felt it was. Okay, enough for an entrepreneur. Why should they take the risk? Well, I think it all depends on your personality. It, um, if you're a personality that's a, that, you know, you like to be doing something that's sort of out on the edge, or you, you like to be have more control over what you're doing, and so you seek ways to create the milieu for the, you, you to be able to do that, or you are responding to an undeniable risk that there is a need for your services in your community. And in order to enable you to provide your services the way you've been taught, it's very difficult to do if you're employed by the top of the hierarchical table, which controls everything, if they don't understand what you're talking about. And that has been physicians control healthcare. So you have to kind of break away and say, no, I want to be able to really do midwifery care. I don't want to have to see a patient every 15 minutes, um, even though it may pay me more money. So there are lots of reasons why women do. Also because you may be and for our distance education people from every state, they are introducing midwifery, for example, in that community. And you have got to be a print, an entrepreneur to do that. So, you know, Kitty, I think you hit on something when you said, something that resounded with me was when you said, if you want to be able to provide your services the way you know how to do it. Right. versus somebody else controlling the way you provide care. Right. That, I think that is such a motivator. Well, now that takes me also to the, the, the three things that are going to determine whether you're going to be successful as an entrepreneur. And one is your relationships. 
you are not saying that the physician is not doing his job. That's a wrong approach. The physician is doing their job. They're doing what they've been taught to do. But the evidence tells us more and more that what they've been taught to do is not appropriate for all women, and particularly not for women that don't have any problems. And so we are, uh, midwifery is a missing link in the delivery of care because the nurses, because they're employed by the hospital, which is a doctor's place of business, they're always going to have to abide by the rules set by the physicians who are directing the healthcare. And they're doing fine, but they need to listen to women and begin to embrace that other piece that most developed countries already have, which is that professional person that is trained to recognize, monitor first, recognize pending problems, get the mother to the appropriate services, and but stays with her. And I never want to see you use the word obstetrics when you're talking about yourself. You are not an, an obstetrical provider. You are a midwife. And so you your very title says what you do. You stay with women. Okay. As what? you answer that, Kitty, I'm sorry, I, didn't, I apologize for interrupting. I'm thinking about the nurse practitioners, too, and their um, desire to provide health promotion in a way that they may not be um, able to do in some settings, but within their own setting where they have more control over it, then that can be a focus of their practice. Yes. Are we talking about nurse practitioners also here, or is this yes, just nurse both. Okay. Both. Well, to me, they're all one and the same. They were one and the same we are. when I trained at Frontier. We didn't have that division, and but it, it came about as primarily because the knowledge base grew to actually require that that we begin to educate nurses as indi individuals who could practice family health and they have to understand that medicine is not health just as obstetrics is not midwifery they are bringing a different dimension to health care which is prevention now public health used to do that but we have all but eliminated public health at least on the streets of america that there used to be public health clinics all over the place run by the health departments, there's nothing. No. All right, okay. I, I, my time is, I'm losing my time. Go ahead. What's okay, your I'm gonna ask you, yeah, let me ask you, if you had to give one piece of advice to nurse midwives or nurse practitioners that were going to own their own business and they were worried about being able to be successful, what um, piece of advice would you give them? And I'm gonna take my picture down because I think I'm distracting from you. I, well, I think, yeah, first of all, they need to do the homework and they need to ask my, ask themselves, why do I want to take the risk? Because they're going to take a risk above and beyond just having become a midwife. And it's usually either to respond to a need to solve some problems, to be uh, demonstrate an example of how to solve the problem so that we can change things, to... Uh, uh, take control and but you never take control without putting right beside it and connecting your collaboration with it and because you think there's money to back it and a market that's going to use it those are the basic reasons for wanting to take a risk and you but you have to understand it's easy to start something it's another thing to sustain it so what you, and you also, most of all, have to consider your family. Are they going to be with you on this? Because there are going to be tough times. But I'm telling you from my own experience, engage them in the mission. 
they will join you. They will help you to create it. And they will create professions and roles for themselves in healthcare, which is good. It's an opportunity for them. Help them to see it. So your success is going to depend on build your ability to build relationships. And that's with the hospital, the administration, the, um, the physicians that you work with, the nurses, particularly the nurses, they're on the ground with you. And they can constitute a sizable resistance to you. Then you have to be resilient and hold to what you set out to do as your mission. That you're going to have down times, how you're going to recover from them, but never give up. And the third and last thing is to document and record what you're doing every day, every week. Document so that you can reflect periodically on your progress and what needs to be done next. So, and my recommendation to all of you is to read and study the best primer I see on the marketplace, which is the autobiography of Mary Breckenridge. And she, she established, she took the risk and established what even today is the most extraordinary regional system for the delivery of care in the, under the most difficult circumstances to the most impoverished and needy people. I mean, you can't make it any harder than that. And I have to say that our first students in distance learning that took that seriously had labeled her book like getting a mini MBA, a master's in business administration, and a mini MPH, a master's in public health. It's all there in the book. And if you want to go through and prove it, as you go through, label, was this a relationship she was building for what she did? That goes back to... Russia, you're her resilience. It took her five tries to get water for the hospital. You know what it's like driving for, going for water in the mountains? Five times. Meanwhile, for almost a year, she had to haul water. That's resilience. And then reflection. The reflection is in the book wide neighborhoods, every bit of it. And I'm absolutely astounded that particularly every nurse midwife student is not required to read it. But I would say every nursing student should be required to read it. She is one of our great heroines. So I'll leave you with that with my reflection. Thank you. So my last question for today is probably the heart of the whole thing. If we decide to take on this um, risk and build the relationships and try to be resilient and try to reflect every day and build a business, what does it matter to the women and the families? Do you think it, what's the difference in the care? The difference... The difference in the care is astounding. It really is. I think it is best stated by the, um, and you know, a, a lot of, there's been a lot of research on this. Maternity Center Association that became Child Risk Connections and did that extraordinary thing, which, you know, hasn't been done since Lesser and Keene did their study in the mid 50s, which was listen to women. And what they discovered was what it meant to the birth experience meant to women that were allowed to experience it. And I think there are two approaches to birth. You can either experience it or escape it. 
and the medical model is helping you to escape it. The midwives are helping you to experience with the medical model at their elbow if they need it. So, and that's often left out and it should never be left out. Um, midwives are never in independent practice. Um, so I think that the little gal in from the Bronx in the first birth and a, a little uh, African-American kid who was just barely a teenager and she was pregnant and she went to the birth center and when she got through, she was one of the ones that my friend Polly Wells uh, interviewed and she said, I think the birth center, which is the midwives, she said, they enable you to feel that if you can give birth, you can do anything. And she said, for me, that was, after I gave birth, I thought, I, I gave life. I, why, I can go back to school. I can finish my high school. I can get a job. I can take care of this baby. I can raise it. Yes, I can. She said, the birth center empowered me to become all I can be. And I think... You know, when you think about the risk that that we're talking about here, for let's say the risk for nurse midwives and nurse practitioners to, you know, to step out and to, to take risks to become the kind of care provider, whatever that means, whatever kind of system that means for them. But you're right, it's more than impacting the diagnosis or the treatment. It's about impacting the woman, the family, their whole lives, and then eventually their whole community. I mean, it does not just affect that one person that you're having that relationship with. It is all-encompassing. Actually, another mother in that film said exactly what you're saying and, and, and lived it by organizing the community to support the person. Yeah, and the, and her husband, the men. Don't forget the men. God, you know, my husband was. That was the highlight of his life, to be at the birth. And he said to his coworkers at Boeing, he said, when they said, "Why in work would you ever have your wife go through all that pain?" No, boy, my wife is having a cesarean section. And he said, "Let me ask you something." If there was somebody came running in here right now and said, down on the street, there's a miracle occurring. Would you just sit here or would you go down to see what was going on? Because I know what I'd do. He said, well, being at the birth was like witnessing a miracle right before you. You know, Kitty, I felt the same way recently being at my mother's bedside as she died. And I thought how um, powerful the passages in life are. Absolutely. And to be able to bear witness to those and to have the right kind of care, people that are supportive of you and your family's desires. And, and so that would be true in so many junctures. But, you know, what a privilege we have as care providers, whether it's at a birth or as um, you know, as a young woman is becoming a woman and our as families are facing uh, frightening diagnoses and prognoses and, and the passing of their loved ones, what an absolute privilege we have. Well, I'm, you're using the word privilege when actually before we became accepted this culture that we now have that is divisive, it was a prerogative, it was a right. I mean, you you wouldn't dream of having your loved one be alone without you there if they were dying or giving birth. Their family was always there. And if you don't believe it, go back to the animals. They haven't been disrupted as much as we have. Right, and I think about as care providers, what an honor we have to be able to bear witness to those 
life events. It, it's amazing. And I, I continually am thankful for the privilege and honor of being able to be with families in their life passages. It's, um, you know, and to get paid for it too. Oh my gracious, what are we talking about? <laughs> I think maybe that's why all my life I never asked how much they were going to pay me. That it mattered. I just, as long as they paid me enough to, to live, um, put a roof over my head and eat and pay my bills, that was enough. Because I'm 91 now and I'm still out there wanting everybody to have this opportunity, either to train as a professional or to be served by a professional team who is giving what now is being called by a group up in Massachusetts the right care. That's all we have to do is start giving the right care, the care that our science tells us to give. Otherwise, you might as well go back to religion and put all the faith in God to do it. Yeah. I think that's enough. I do too, Kitty. Thank you so much. It's always fun to get to talk with you. And so thank you guys who are listening. Um, I hope you've been encouraged and inspired. I know I have. It makes me um, proud to be a nurse midwife, proud to be a nurse practitioner, and I'm thankful to get to do what I do every day and be a part of um, guiding students into the same professions. So thank you, Kitty. You're welcome. Thank you.